Yeah, so this is uh, as kind of, kind of a leafy joint work with Stefan here. Um, and going to tell you a little bit about how we designed a new default color map for Matplotlib and you know, how you can too. Hopefully, sort of just like showing you color maps is boring. So hopefully, you actually learn something about <laughs> how this all works. Um, so, color maps, right? Color maps are pretty important in science because you have this problem like you gather a bunch of data, there's I think 440 numbers there, and you just look at that and it's like, what, I, wh what do you do? Like, you can't make any sense of this, right? Um, but if you have some nice like ordering of colors, and then you map different values to those colors, and then you go through and you do that for each of your data points, suddenly you can see what's going on. Right, so the, the color map's really important because it's this it's the interface between your data and your brain, basically. Right? It's the exact same data, but over here <laughs> makes a lot more sense. Right? But not all color maps are created equal. Um, so for example, this one in the upper left here is called Jet. Um, it is the current Matplotlib default. It used to be the MATLAB default for many, many, many years also. Uh, it's mostly famous for um, how much it distorts data. Um, I, there's like a big literature on this, like, liter like literally dozens of papers about why you should never use JET. Um, just to pick one uh, that I think is particularly something. Um, so Borkin et al. did this like a uh, user study. They had um, a bunch of doctors who used this tool to look at um, these imaging results on arteries to try and figure out do these people have heart disease? Like do we need to intervene? Like what's going on here? And of course, the tool they actually use every day is one that uses this you know, rainbow jet kind of color map up here, because you know, that's just the default color map everyone uses. Um, and they tried comparing it to uh, some sort of more uh, rationally designed color maps over here. And what they found is if you asked the doctors, which of these color maps works best for you? What do you like? They said, oh yeah, the jet one. That, you know, they're practiced with it. It's nice and colorful. They like it. But if you actually look at their performance, then when they're using JET as compared to these, they're about twice as slow, and they make more diagnostic errors, right? <laughs> like, jet, like, defaults matter, right? I mean, it's a joke, but like, <laughs> it's true. Like, you know, it may have killed people. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but. <laughs> so, right, so can we do any better? Um, well, okay, so if we want to do something better, we have to decide, like, what do we want to do instead? Um, Here's one sort of possible candidate that might come to mind. Um, it's called Perula, sort of a funny name. It's named after this bird, Perula americana. Um, this is uh, MATLAB's new default they finally switched to last year after inflicting jet on the rest of us for decades. Um, it's not great, maybe. I don't know. The projector's kind of not showing it to its best light here, actually. But um, it's a lot better than jet. Um, so you might think, OK, let's, we could just use that, keep it easy. Um, except um, if you ask them, they say, no, no, we, we put a lot of work into this, so you can't have it. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to say like the MathWorks like, wants you to die, but I might kind of humorously imply it. <laughs> like, um, okay, fine. <laughs> We're not going to use Perula. I'm sure it's not that great anyway. Right, we'll, we'll just make a better one, right? Finest open source um, strategy. How hard could it be? Uh, this slide also, by coincidence, explains why it took me seven years to finish my PhD. <laughs> so, yeah, Rick, are you aware? Uh, why did you, why did you write Perula? Was there an evaluation that is similar? Uh, we'll get into sort of the, well, actually, so, you know, right, what makes a color map good or bad, right? So we have to decide this. Um, so, well, one thing that people, a default color map should probably be colorful because people like that and you want them to actually use this um, and pretty for the same reason. Um, it should probably be sequential. So as opposed to like diverging or circular, these other kinds of color maps that assume some structure in your data. Because if it's a default color map, like you don't know, like for like a divergent color map, you need to know what is the center of the data and then look at deviations from that. For if you just, someone just plots something and doesn't tell you anything about their data, you can't make that new assumption. So we probably just want a color map that just sort of assumes that numbers get bigger as they get bigger. That we can be pretty confident of. Um, it, we want it to accurately re represent the data in this meaning sort of, we call this like perceptually uniform. So like if it looks like there's a big jump in colors, that should mean that there actually is a big jump in the data and vice versa, right? 
Um, it would be nice, especially for a default that people sort of use all the time without really kind of thinking about it. Um, if it works well, even if it's printed in black and white, because that does happen a lot. Um, and because we are you know, decent human beings, we want it to be accessible to as wide an audience as possible, so we want it to be um, usable even for people who are colorblind. So, okay, these you know, top ones you can, are kind of subjective or easy. These ones, you gotta actually sort of think, okay, what is, that sounds nice, of course you want it to be perceptually uniform, what is that actually, how do you do that? <laughs> you have to know something about how color works and brains work and all that. So let me quickly teach you all of color theory, <laughs> so I can do that. Okay, I mean, it's not actually, yeah, it's a 15 minute version, but um, I think people have a lot of misconceptions and like there's all sorts of weird folklore and such about color. It's not that complicated actually, if, if you sort of know how it fits together. So I'm gonna try and sort of give you that, sort of the big picture how it fits together and so then you will able to go read Wikipedia and not just drown in a sea of acronyms. So we're scientists, right? Let's start from the basics. How does, how does this work? What's going on? So if you have some data and you, show it using a color mask, first thing that happens is each of those data points gets mapped to some RGB value, which is just like some triple of numbers, which gets sent as a signal down to your monitor. The monitor spits out some photons. This is what photons look like according to Wikipedia. Um, those photons hit your eye, go in through the lens, and hit the sensor uh, at the back, the retina, which transmutes them into some sort of chemical sim uh, electrochemical signal which gets shot out the back, down a nerve fiber to your brain, and then your brain does something with it, turns it into your subjective perception via a process that apparently involves lighting. Um, so if you understand how, uh, you know, what's going on when our, with our color map, we need to understand these steps, like what's happening as we go through. The place to start actually is to look at how light and the retina interact, because that turns out to be, there's a massive simplification here that makes everything else a lot easier. So how does this work? Well, so people often talk about colors and light in terms of wavelengths, but that's actually kind of confusing, because when light is not like, there's, you can't talk about the wavelength of light, because any given light source has lots and lots of different wavelengths in it. Any, a single photon has a wavelength, but like an actual light has many, many photons, many, many different wavelengths. So, I mean, you could have a, uh, um, a light that is just lots and lots of photons all the same wavelength. So, for example, this laser pointer is such a light. But most light sources have a mixture of lots of different wavelengths. All kinds of wacky stuff can happen. Now, when that hits your eye, um, your eye has three different sensor cells in it that are relevant for us right now. Call them one, two, three. And basically, the, each of the, them is sensitive to different mixture of wavelengths. And so what happens is this is just like a matrix product, right? We, we understand linear algebra. Um, it makes things easy. Um, what's going on here is we've got the, some high dimensional vectors over here, which are the actual, how the world really works. And then the, we hit these uh, three different cell types and that's this massive dimensionality reduction, right? Um, there's many, many different vectors over here that get squished down to the same vector over here. And that three dimensional signal is what actually goes to the brain. And so we can make our lives a lot easier in dealing with color if we, instead of trying to keep track of all these different spectra, which usually lots of them, distinctions there don't even matter because the eye throws it away. Instead, we'll keep track of all the different possible signals that come here. So each possible three-dimensional um, signal cor corresponds to this infinite high-dimensional hyperplane of different spectra that all are I indistinguishable from our point of view. We don't need to worry about it. Um, okay, so let, so what people did back in the 30s is say, okay, can we make a, uh, um, a map of all the different possible, uh, of that three-dimensional space? Give it a, a coordinate, set of coordinates. So basically, you know, find a basis, right? Now, you might think the natural basis would be just to use these three basis vectors, but it was 1930, they didn't have any way to measure <laughs> those. <laughs> all they could do was measure uh, what people find indistinguishable or not. And so you can, you can find, you can identify the subspace, but not the, specific, the uniquely identified basis. So they just picked an arbitrary basis. And so this is the one they picked. It has these three coordinate axes called x, y, and z. So we're looking at a three-dimensional uh, plot here. So imagine we're like looking, looking straight down the x, uh, it? where they're all equal, right? It's coming straight out of the screen. So we're, lo we're looking down at this like three-dimensional coordinate axis, right? And, to get sort of, and you can imagine that whatever um, colors 
the set of possible colors is not actually the whole space because you can't have negative photons, right? So in the high dimensional space, it's just like the positive quadrant is the only is the space of possible spectra. This gets projected down. You have you're going to end up with some sort of like kind of conical kind of thing coming out of the origin, right? And then to sort of get a sense of what that cone looks like, we're going to take a slice through that three-dimensional space and look at a cross-section of it, right? So this is the slice of x plus y plus e equals 1, right? It's so sort of the standard simplex. And when you take that slice, what you get is this classic kind of color shark fin <laughs> diagram that you may have seen before. Um, so, right, so like what's, what's and so right, this is, in fact, what you have then is this thing just sort of like an infinite cone like that coming out, and we're just, this is a slice through. And that's what it looks like. Okay. So uh, get, try and sort of get oriented. Um, we can try and look at, take some uh, wavelengths that we under, or sort of light spectra that we understand and figure out where they go here. So for example, my laser pointer right here uh, has that spectra, and it lands right here. Um, if I have a red laser pointer, it has a different spectra, right? Um, and that spectra lands like right here. Um, and you can see, uh, one thing you can immediately see is that this diagram is totally a lie, right? Like the actual color I'm showing here. Because if this were actually showing all these different colors correctly, you would not be able to see my green laser pointer there, because that would be what the projector was already showing you. Obviously, that is not the case, because, yeah, projectors are terrible. <laughs> um, so, um, so imagine like you know all the stuff around the edges here really should be like extra super glowy intense like the laser pointer. You can also um, I have a yeah. What's that? What? So it's going it's going to be some kind of shape, um, and it turns out that it kind of has a, some curvature to it. Is what it, it just what happens if you take that high dimensional thing? projected down through those particular sensor cell basis vectors you have in your eye. Um, actually, let me come back to this in like one minute, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so this is it's only identified up to a linear transformation. So they sort of arbitrarily picked it, so the linear transformation such that this would kind of neatly fit inside the triangle. Um, but yeah, why it kind of has a curve to it is not, it's just kind of how it ends up working. Um, but we'll say a little bit more about that, right? So one thing we can also do with this representation that's useful is you might think like you might want to be able to predict what other kinds of wavelengths <laughs> would look like or different spectra, right? So for example, what if I have a light that consists of a mixture of these two kinds of uh, photons? What will that look like? Well, we know that in the high dimensional space, this is just like a mixture of these two lights, right? If you actually, if you took two lasers and pointed them in the same direction, you, what you get was a light that had this spe spectrum. So you, this um, spectrum is a linear combination of these two spectra. Linear combinations are preserved under linear projection, which means down in this space, it, the point corresponding to this spectrum should be the linear combination of this point and this point. So it should, we should end up somewhere around here, is what we would think. And in fact, if you do the experiment, you do, you get a nice yellow. <laughs> Um, and so that also sort of explains something about this shape here. So what's going on here is this uh, line on the edge is the set of all sort of laser-like pure spectral colors. And the reason for that is that if you think in the high dimensional space, these kind of laser-like spectra are a basis. They're the natural basis, right? Any kind of you know, light you can make, you can make by mixing together a bunch of single wavelengths, which means that the space of all possible spectra is the convex hull of these kinds of vectors. And that means you project it down, that's still true. So here's all of where all the uh, single wavelength things happen to land if you just, if you do linear algebra, and then the space of all possible colors is just the, all the things you can make as a convex combination. So it, it makes a lot of sense, actually, if you, you know, you sort of, you know, you think back to freshman, sophomore linear algebra, you can, it all kind of fits together. Okay, so that, that's what's going on with sort of light in the retina, and now that this has this great simplifying thing, now we can think about this three-dimensional space of colors. We, we think about, we try and identify these equivalence classes of spectra instead of having to think about exact spectra. And now, so let's think about what's going on with the monitors. Um, and the people who make monitors know about everything I just told you, and they take advantage of it 
Right? So they say, instead of trying to figure, make it so all monitors spit out the fit you, you pr give them a particular signal, they spit out a, a fixed spectra for that signal. Instead, they're designed so that for any particular signal, you can predict what XYZ coordinates you'll get. It may or may not be the same spectra. In fact, it will, will be different for different monitors, but there'll be different spectra that look the same, so it's okay. So in the way the monitor works, basically there's three little lights in each pixel. You can turn each light on more or less strongly. And like I said, we don't need to know exactly what photons come out as long as we know where each of these lights are in XYZ space, how strongly each one's turned on. Then hey, this is just like what we were saying about like mixing the lasers together, right? You're mixing together, if these are the three lights, which they ought to be for a good monitor, um, then these are the colors you can get, are the linear combinations of those, right? This, you can also see why the diagram is totally a lie. It can only possibly tell the truth in that triangle. Everything outside is stuff the monitor can't do, right? Um, and so, yes, and then there's just, you can go look it up. There's like a standard for like how a monitor is supposed to work for a standard, you know, mo computer monitor you have on your desktop called sRGB. Um, those are the three lights you use. This is the curve that maps, if you send like, you know, 10 or 100 or 50, 50 or whatever as your number for how strongly it should be turned on. It doesn't actually turn on, send out 10 or 50 or 100 times more photons. There's this nonlinear mapping. Um, that's because this is how old cathode ray tubes worked, and now we emulate them in software. Oh. <laughs> so that's how it, you just, but so yeah, so you need to know what that curve is. Again, you just, you look it up, there's an equation that it's like sort of the standard that everyone's, all the monitors, it was originally written down as like an attempt to describe how monitors in actual use worked. Now all the monitor manufacturers look at this curve and try and match it. But, oh. So if you know these two things, then for any given set of RGB values, you say, okay, we'll use the sRGB standard, tells me how to interpret those, tells me which XYZ values I'm going to get. So we're doing pretty good, right? Now we know we can get from data all the way around to XYZ, figure out how our, when, we, when we're trying to understand how our color map works. All we got to do is do this little bit right now, just figure out how to go, just retina to perception. No piece of cake, right? <laughs> so yeah, oh, Jess is laughing because <laughs> she's a psychologist and knows this is the diagram that everyone likes to scare uh, psych and neuroscience students with. This is a simplified wiring diagram of the early visual system. <laughs> Each of these little boxes is basically a supercomputer. Um, we're not, we don't try to like simulate this. <laughs> it's not what we do. Instead, um, we uh, just, we do some, uh, so yeah, I kind of spoiled that, didn't I? Uh, we do, um, we kind of uh, do some sort of curve fitting, trying to get built in simplified models and kind of capture the important parts. Um, probably the most important thing that's different between how you perceive light and how light, you know, the signal from your retina or whatever, is that, well, there's a lot that's different. First of all, I should make it very clear. Like, just knowing, like, what the, is coming out of your retina does not tell you at all what something's going to look like, as, I mean, this famously shows, right, people, you know, wildly disagree on what it looks like, even though they're getting the exact same light, right? All right, okay. Who uh, sees blue here? And gold there, so, yeah. Okay, how about the other one, which is, is uh, what is the other one? Blue, but, sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. I have totally missed that. Okay. Okay. Who sees blue and black? That's a, who sees white and gold? Right, yeah. <laughs> it's really compelling. Um, so the reason for this is that your eye doesn't necessarily care like about the photons per se. Your eye's trying to figure out how does the world work. And so if the lighting changes, like if, if the light's redder or blue or yellow or whatever, that kind of changes the photons that you're getting from everything, but it doesn't change what the objects actually look like, right? Or it shouldn't. The objects stay the same. If you want to like try and your point of vision is to understand what the world, how the world works. So you want to correct for the lighting. And so your eye's always trying to figure out, okay, what is the light source? And then I'm going to kind of sort of normalize everything against that. So if you think that you're kind of in a dark lighting and you get these kind of pixel values, it looks like white and gold. If you think you're in sort of a bright yellow lighting and you get these pixel values, which by the way are exactly the same in these two pictures. <laughs> Did I? No, I took out, no, they are, I promise, they are. <laughs> um, then it looks totally different, right? 
So it's not just about the pixels of the barrel, all this sort of complicated downstream processing. Um, and in particular, because you have this kind of white, uh, white point normalization, you might call it, the space of all, uh, <laughs> the space of all um, lights is this giant infinite cone, right? But in any given scene, there's like the brightest thing sort of sets, that's what white is. And then you divide everything by that. So in practice, you get the space of colors is sort of this finite blob, right? So that's what does that. So this is kind of like a picture of the space of perceptual colors, what things actually look like. We usually do it, so there's one axis here, the vertical axis is from dark to light. And then there's two axes here, one is green to red and one is blue to yellow. And that's sort of all the different possible hues at a given brightness, right? Hues and degrees of saturation, right? So if you get towards the middle, it's sort of more gray. If you move out towards the edge, it's more like really, really blue or red or whatever. So this is a useful space to have in mind. This is the space of colors you get to play with if you're trying to design a color map. Um, there's lots of different models about how exactly to do that perceptual thing. They're trying to sort of simplify the, how the brain actually works into something you actually use. Um, the 1976 state-of-the-art model is sort of what you might expect from what I said. Um, you take your XYZ value, you normalize it by whatever the assumed white point is. Uh, there's this nonlinearity that's in brightness perception for whatever reason. There's nonlinearities in everything about perceptions. So, so you approximate it with this uh, cube root thing. And then you do a change of basis and you rescale to kind of move to a more useful coordinate space where like, you know, like where one axis really is sort of brightness is kind of the idea, right? Um, you can see this is a very simple model um, designed in the era when you would be doing it like with a calculator. Um, there's a more recent model, 2002. Um, the math looks like this. Three pages of equations. Um, so to sort of compare and contrast, this is sort of what many people have heard of. It's very popular, common, and used. Um, it's primarily designed as a model of color distance. This other one I'm talking about, CKM02, is state of the art for estimating things like brightness and hue. It's like, what does it actually look like? How blue is it? That kinds of questions. Um, which and it's much better at that than lab is. So for lab, you can have colors that are allegedly the same hue, but they aren't. <laughs> it's pretty common, actually. Um, because they only really were trying to get an you know, to measure how far apart colors were. CKMO2 is really good at like, you know, capturing hue and saturation and all those things, but it doesn't even try to be a model of color distance. Um, so what we're actually going to use is a third model called CAMO2 UCF, which is built off of CKMO2, and so it sort of inherits all its, you know, its good stuff. And then it um, sort of rescales things in such a way to make it also be a really excellent model of color distance. So th that diagram is showing you this is the CAMO2 UCF space. And the idea is that like, if you follow a line straight up or down, it stays the same color and same saturation. It just gets brighter or darker. Everything at the same level like this is really is the same brightness, that kind of thing, because of all those three pages of math, to try and do it. Um, but it's also the case in this space that you know, if the distance, just the Euclidean distance between two points is a pretty good estimate of how similar a human would judge those two colors. So this is really nice. Now, once we're actually working in this space, then it's really, you can sort of forget about all this. stuff. It's very easy to um, design, you know, draw curves that have particular properties, whatever you like. So great, so now we know how to do everything, right? Um, given some SRG, we can convert it to XYZ. We can do a bunch of math, given XYZ values, convert it to KMO2 UCF. We have a computer to do that for us, so it's pretty easy to do. And so with all these things, that's enough to you know, complete the circle. Now, given some data, we can see how does it actually look to people? How does your brain process this? At least that's for most people. But what about colorblind people? Remember, not everyone actually you know, has the same eyes. So what's going on with that? So remember I said there's these three different kinds of sensors in the eye right? that you know, are sensitive to different mixtures of wavelengths. Um, th there's four kinds of common color blindness. And they all have very similar effects. So you see how these two sensors here look really, really similar. They're not quite identical. This one's like a little bit lower and a little bit more peaked. Um, but they're very similar, right? And what happens in color blindness is either you have one of those sensors is kind of mixed, messed up so that it becomes even more similar to the other one, not very helpful, or one of them's missing entirely, right? Um, 
And those are all relatively common. The, the, the ones where they can be more or less, this, as actually like a client, you can have more or less severe, severe versions of this. Um, so OK, so basic facts about this. Um, this is you know, the one disadvantage in life that hits white men the worst. Um, the reason is, well, I don't, it's just, I don't know why it is that it happens to be most common among people of European descent, but it is by some amount. Um, it's much more common among men than women because the uh, gene that codes for these two, uh, the proteins there, the, the one that gets messed up, is on the X chromosome. Most men only have one X chromosome, so if a gene's messed up, that's it. Most women have two X chromosomes, so they, you know, even if one's mixed up, well, maybe you still have a backup. So if you look at the rates, you, might, you have to, you have, they have to lose the lottery twice, um, and so the, the rate of it among women is about, you know, the rate among men squared. So that thing has to happen twice. Yeah. Um, and the effect of this is, so, wait, so those are very similar uh, sensors, but they do give you some sensitivity to some like particular bits of the wavelength, of the spectra, rather. Particular wavelengths sort of right on those edges. The way your eye exploits that, or your eye, brain, everything put together, is that you act, compute the difference between the output of those two sensors. And that gives you kind of a nice signal for some particular narrow bits of the spectrum. And that signal is mostly the red versus green signal. So we have these four different types, but they all kind of have the same effect of making these two sensors outputs even more similar than they normally are. And that has the effect of it kind of takes that red-green axis and kind of squishes it down partially or all the way if you're missing it entirely. Right. Um, and so that's why you can, there's these models you can, you know, read about, download, implement, whatever, to try and estimate. So if you have, if this is what it looks like to someone with regular color vision, this is what it might look like to people with just different variants of red green color blindness. I think how do these models work? They cheat a lot. <laughs> so you, first of all, if you think, if you think about it, right, um, if, especially if you're in this, you know, three quarters of people with colorblind actually have three dimensions of vision, just they have different sensors, which means they actually are seeing a different slice of that infinite uh, high dimensional, super complicated reality, right? So you can actually have two colors that look identical to someone with normal vision that look different to somebody who is colorblind, right? <laughs> But like in something like a photo like this, the camera does not actually capture the spectra of the real scene, right? The camera's job is like, hey, it knows how regular people's eyes works. It tries to, first thing it does is throw away that high dimensional space, reduce it to something that will let it reproduce what it looked like to someone with regular color vision. It has no idea what it would look like to someone with, um, who was colorblind, especially the anomalous trichromacy kind. Uh, so, the way you deal with this in these kinds of like simulations of color blindness is you don't even try. What you actually try to simulate is, well, okay, not what, what would this scene look like if someone's colorblind was looking at it, but what would this picture look like if someone colorblind was looking at it on a monitor? <laughs> That's what the model is actually trying to simulate. And furthermore, because you need to know the actual spectra being emitted, it's not enough to know the XYZ coordinates. And like we said, different monitors vary on that. So if you, the model isn't even assuming, trying to model what it looks like if they're looking at it on this monitor. It's trying what they would look, if they were looking at this on a different monitor. <laughs> in fact, I think for the model that we're using here, just the one, because it's the one that's sort of easily available in the literature, they're trying to simulate what if someone colorblind were looking at this image as shown on a particular CRT monitor. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah, you do your best. <laughs> it's a useful tool. It kind of gives you some approximation. Don't count on it for the details. Um, but also just sort of, it's useful, I think, kind of have a sense of like how this actually works. It's not magic, right? It's just, you know, sort of working through the math. Um, you might also look at this and think, this is a really weird way to design a visual system, right? <laughs> like, why is it that you have these two sensors that are like almost identical? And why is it that those two sensors get messed up in all these different ways that all kind of have these similar effects? But not, you, don't, you very, very rarely see other kinds of mess up. Like, it's possible, but it's like a thousand times rarer, right? Like, what's going on here, right? So, um, as Kevin mentioned, um, I spent three years in Edinburgh. And one thing you learn if you move from California to Scotland is how much, you know, how important guacamole is. 
and how much you miss it, right? Because <laughs> um, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's delicious. Um, it does have one um, annoying feature though, right? Which is if you don't eat it immediately, I don't know why you would not eat it immediately, but if you don't, and you let it sit for a while, it gets kind of brown and icky after a while, right? Um, does anyone know, what, what do you do to stop that happening? <laughs> Lemon, yeah, right? And which is great, because like, you, you think, okay, I put in the lemon, it makes it stop looking terrible, but lemon is also delicious. <laughs> so it also makes it taste wonderful, right? So isn't that a nice coincidence, right? That the lemon solves both of these problems for us. Um, you might ask, why does lemon help? It's kind of random. Um, the answer is because what's going, the problem here is that oxygen in the air is very reactive, and it's attacking the various molecules on the guacamole and breaking them down, right? Oxidizing them. Lemon juice has ascorbic acid, vitamin C in it, which is a potent antioxidant, right? It stops oxygen from attacking things like that, which is also one of the reasons why your body really likes vitamin C, because your body doesn't like being attacked, it's, you know, proteins being attacked by oxidants either. So you have to make sure you have vitamin C or you'll get scurvy, and that is really not a fun time, right? It turns out, though, in fact, like vitamin C is so important, like it's such a useful molecule, and it's not, a, it's not very complicated or anything. It's so important. Almost every creature in this world can make their own vitamin C. It's totally immune to scurvy. We're actually really weird in that we can get scurvy. So like among all of mammals, um, bats can get scurvy, guinea pigs can get scurvy, and primates, at least haplorhynia primates, can get scurvy. Like every other mammal, it's totally immune, which is kind of weird, right? And what's going on here is that these are three different clouds that happen to have diets that are very, very rich in vitamin C, just sort of by accident, right? So like, you know, starting about that point in the evolutionary tree, primates were, you know, basically living on like fresh fruit and like fresh newly spreaded leaves, which have tons and tons of vitamin C in it. And so what happened is you had some, you know, ancient proto-monkey, who had a mutation in their gene they needed to synthesize vitamin C that messed it up, so it didn't work anymore. But no one noticed, because they were getting so much vitamin C from their diet, this was totally, it didn't affect their life at all, right? They still had kids and all of that. And so over time, just entropy happened, and this gene just got lost, and no one noticed. Until, you know, many, 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 many millennia later, like you have like the age of sale, <laughs> and for the first time, you have people, you know, living on these, you know, like basically beef jerky <laughs> for months at a time, and the preservation process turns out it destroys vitamin C, and all terrible things happen, right? Oh. So, right, that's what's going on with vitamin C. Yeah, and guinea pigs and bats also have diets, different diets, but also ones that happen to be very high in vitamin C. Similar thing happens. Um, another interesting thing about evolution is that most of the creatures on this picture, in fact, uh, almost all mammals, are dichromats. They're like people on this one. They only have two senses in their eyes. Uh, the reason for that is that, well, actually, way, way, way back in vertebrate evolution, almost all vertebrates actually have four sensors. So that's the ancestral form. But the common ancestor of all mammals was probably like a nocturnal burrowing critter that that's a useful way to live if you want to survive the KT event that killed off the dinosaurs. But it means you don't make a lot of use of your color vision if you spend all your time underground or only come out at night. And so the same kind of thing happened as with the vitamin C, right? You don't use it, entropy happens, you lose it, right? And so mammals in general are colorblind in the sense that they have two sensors, not the three that we take for granted. There's one exception to that among the placental mammals, which are primates. So starting around here, um, you have, start seeing polymorphic tri trichromats. So this is sort of like, you know, trichromacy light, <laughs> the budget version. So what, what happens in these uh, critters is that you have the different um, uh, genes for the different kinds of cells. Those ones, I, sorry, those ones I showed you, uh, you know, the number one and number two but they're still, they're located at the same place on the chromosome. So if you have one X chromosome, you get one of them. Sorry, you only get, so that gives you two sensors total. 
If you have two X chromosomes, you might get the same one twice, in which case, again, you've got two total. Or but if you have two X chromosomes that have a different settings for that gene, no, 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 you can use both and you get three total. So it's something like a third of these creators, mostly, you know, basically all females, are trichromats, the rest are dichromats. And then in a few uh, lineages, they figured out another trick of why don't we, we can take those two genes and make a copy of it <laughs> so that it's possible to have both at once, even if you only have one X chromosome, right? So this is, this is why color, you know, that, X, that last third dimension is kind of fragile, right? It's this very recent thing in evolutionary time. The way we got it is that we took that existing gene and just made some little tweaks to it, you know, poked at it until the protein looked a little different, was sensitive to a little bit different light. That's why they have such similar you know, receptive uh, patterns. Um, and it's also why it's sort of fragile, right? Because those genes are very similar. It's very easy for the, when things are getting copied around for them to get mixed up or to end up with sort of half of one and half of the other. So you get a, end up with a protein that's kind of a sensitivity kind of in between, all that kind of stuff, right? It also sort of tells an interesting story about the guacamole, right? Because, you know, for those of us with full, full three-dimensional vision, this looks disgusting. But if you're most mammals, they don't look very different, actually. So the moral of the story is that, you know, it's not actually a coincidence that the lemon both makes it tastier and makes it look better. In fact, our ability to tell that it looks better is evolution's way of tricking us into eating delicious lemon. Okay, <laughs> back to color maps. <laughs> I just couldn't resist. I had enough time, you know. It's just, yeah. So, you know, hopefully you learned something anyway, right? Even if it's not about color maps. So color maps. So now we know how to take model regular color vision and also colorblind color vision. Give it any color map, we can tell you, okay, how, does it, how is this actually going to function, right? How is it going to work? Um, is it actually going to be a good interface between your data and your brain? Um, do that, uh, we wrote some code to actually implement those transformations. So you can try this yourself, this little color spacious library. Um, it's very easy to use. You just say, okay, I have some coordinates in our sRGB space scaled to be from zero to one, and I want them in camo to UCS. Bam, here you go. The way it works under the covers is it's got this, you know, just like I showed you, it knows all to make all these little transformations from one space to another, which we implemented using NumPy and all that. And this is where it's like, yes, Python. <laughs> because so you want that numerical stuff to figure out like how do you convert from, you know, X, sRGB linearized to XYZ, whatever. Um, but then it's really a hassle trying to like, we actually tried this trial, it was really annoying, trying to like say, okay, first I convert sRGB to here, and then to here, and then here, right. So what we did is we said, okay, we'll just put this graph into the program. This, this picture I'm showing you is actually dumped from the source code, right? Like the program knows this graph. And when I say, I got sRGB1, I want camo 2 UCS, it's okay. I'll just do a little graph search, find a path, and apply those in order, done. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it's nice having data structures, right? <laughs> Try doing that in MATLAB, it'd be such a pain. <laughs> okay, anyway, so not that there's anything wrong with MATLAB. <laughs> Some of my best friends use MATLAB. Um, okay, so we have this capability now. Um, another interesting anecdote while developing that, of course, it's hard to like know, did you get those three pages of math right, for example, right? Did you have a typo somewhere? Um, but fortunately, Mark Fairchild, who wrote the book on the subject, has a nice little spreadsheet on his website you can download that implements those calculations. And it's great because like, normally spreadsheets are annoying, but in this case it's really nice because you can see all the intermediate results right there. So when something goes wrong, at the end point you can just track back and see where did you, your calculation diverge from his. So I, was, you know, I wrote a bunch of tests like you know, plugging numbers into there and making sure mine matched. Uh, except there was, I kept fixing this bug before I couldn't figure out what the bug was. Like, I was getting a different answer. What was, what was going on here? I eventually figured it worked out. There was actually an error in the spreadsheet. So I emailed him just to let him know. And he said, huh, that's funny. I mean, a lot of people have reviewed this spreadsheet. Um, no one's found any errors in the last 13 years. <laughs> so the like, moral of the story, like, test your code, right? I don't know, like, sometimes, I don't think, like, science is actually, like, being, you know, a, in like a Cold War spy novel or something like that, but 
It kind of is. Like, like <laughs> just this like, sense of paranoia. Trust nobody. <laughs> right? Your advisor probably isn't like a Soviet agent trying to backstab you, but <laughs> do you know that? <laughs> Maybe you should write some tests. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's actually, you know, okay, we've got tools, let's use them now, okay. We built, we built a little tool to now to like, let us take a color map and like fix, see what's going on with this, what is, how does the color map work, how good is it, that kind of thing. So here's Jet, fit, fed into our tool, you can try it yourself at home, pretty easy. Um, so we see up here is just, that's the color map itself. And then down here, what we've done is we've calculated perceptually how far apart are adjacent points on this color map, because it's like a derivative. Right. And if it's perceptually uniform, if it moves smoothly, this should just be a nice flat light, which you can see Jet is not so great. <laughs> um, so what's going on? So like for example, this big peak here is when it suddenly jumps from blue to green, pretty quickly. That really flat bit is there's just like it doesn't change at all for a bit there. Jet is terrible. <laughs> Don't let your kids use Jet. Um, over here we have the same thing. Just we convert to black and white first. So it's like if you were printed it on a black and white printer. Um, and then the same thing for the black and white version, again, terrible. Here's the four different common types of color blindness. Not looking so great. And then down here, um, this is more useful in the interactive version if you actually run it. Um, this just takes the uh, points on the color map and it draws them in that three-dimensional space. So you can sort of see what it's actually doing. In fact, let me just pull that up. Um, what is this thing? Oh, shoot. Um, there's many options. We can talk about, we'll talk a, later a bit about some of the, um, uh, some of the reasons why you might uh, want one or another. Is that, there we go. So here's the uh, interactive version so you can actually like it around and get a sense of how it's laid out. Um, and so you can see, it, yeah, it sort of it has a sort of funny, not very well thought out <laughs> kind of path. You can also see these little dots are equally spaced in data space. So if there's a big jump, that means that it's not very uniform. If they're really squished together, it means it's not very uniform. Right. And you can also see kind of what's going on with Jet. So if I click this button, it shows me this is the space of all colors you can actually show on a monitor. And then basically, they're just like, we want color. So we're going to go right to the edge of that space and stay there. <laughs> that was kind of the design principle that underlays that. And then over on the right here, we just have some sample images we made up um, to, uh, oh, sh did I, uh, to uh, so you can sort of see how it works. Um, I just I want to flip back to this now so I can compare it to. Um, so this is a, a version for Perula. You can sort of see, for example, uh, like on this is a topographic uh, view of Mount St. Helens. You can see Jet adds all these like sharp lines, like you know, it looks like a fried egg. They're not really there. Or down here, um, what you actually have are sort of these smooth uh, paths, sort of moving through this uh, area where they get higher. Jet like totally flips it, like it kind of looks like it. I don't know, it just looks terrible, right? And it really distorts your data. Don't use Jet. Um, we can also then, here's Perula, um, MATLAB's a new default. You can see, okay, it's not flat perfectly, but it's a, doing a lot better than Jet. Notice the scale here, that goes to 200, that goes to 700. Um, it's a lot better, um, though it does, it is a little weird, so it's got this big peak over here, and if you, it's not, it's, the projector is kind of mangling everything, but if you look at it on, on a good computer screen, you look at this, it actually is kind of a weird bump there where it's like, it has this nice smooth thing and then it's just like, ah, oh, blue, 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 like this weird little thing. Once you notice it, it's kind of hard to stop seeing it. Um, they didn't even try to make it smooth in black and white space. And you can see this is, they sort of, how they designed it. They have this kind of clever trick. They started with blue, swung over through green, and then they dodged over into orange to get a little more length before finishing up at the yellow. Yeah, that's, yeah, to make it a little, Give a little more variation over. Yeah. Um, so what's going on with this? Why is it kind of distorted and all that? Um, 
Well, it turns out um, the way this color map was designed is they picked a curve, and then they made the, the points equally spaced in lab space. Right? And here I'm using camera two UCS, and they're different, and so they get different results. Um, and which is better, why, or why is Perula actually, you know, we, so we thought, okay, like, camera 2 uses is actually telling us something because we looked at it and, yeah, there is this weird blue hump <laughs> when you actually look at it. What's going on here? Well, so it turns out if you look at, back to the literature on, there's lots and lots of literature on how do you design models of how similar colors are, very, like, important industrially and all things like that. Um, then for colors that are far away, C-Lab and camera 2 UCS both do pretty well. Lots of different models all do pretty well, about the same. For colors that are very similar, sort of fine distinctions, lab is terrible, right? <laughs> These numbers are, uh, sorry, are like error. Like in, you, you, uh, you ask a bunch of people, how similar is th are these colors? How about these ones, these ones? Yeah, and bigger is bad, lower is better. So yeah, lab is really bad at estimating similarity between nearby colors. So that's exactly what, for a color map, where you want it to be uniform, is actually what you need, right? You're like calculating like a derivative. Like it's, it's all about being smooth locally. Um, and, we, and Camo2 UCS is basically state of the art on both kinds of things. Notice also like these are all mostly different. Uh, all the other ones on here are mostly not even the same. Um, that's because mostly people design a model either for nearby colors or for faraway colors. Camo2 UCS is kind of unique. It's not quite the very best for some of these, but it does really well at everything. So that's why it's a nice choice rep. So, um, okay, so now we've seen why Jet is really terrible in Perula. I mean, okay, but it could be better. Um, now, can we go the other way? We, um, given a description of, like, here's what, how we want it to work, give me a color map like that. We can, right? So we, we can say, like, give them, here's how the data, here's what I want each possible thing to look like, and then you can take those mathematical stuff, invert it, and convert back to a, a color map in RGB space. So here's just like a demo to show you how easy this can be. Say you want to have a circular color map, because you're trying to like do a plot of like angles or something. So you don't want it to be that like angle 359 degrees and one degree look totally different. I mean, they will if you just like one and 359, those are really different. Those color maps, you know, will quite rightfully make those look very different. But if you, they're angles, they, they should look the same, right? So how are we gonna do this? Well, you might think, okay, so I want an arc in that color space. It should be a circle, because <laughs> that's what I want. So what I'm gonna do is draw a circle with constant lightness, and I'm gonna take a bunch of points equally spaced along that, and that will be my color map. So we just say, all right, uh, say 100 points. I'm going to set my brightness, which is called J prime, because that's the notation, to be 75. I'm going to have a radius of 30, and I'm just going to do a little trigonometry to make a circle in 3D space with those coordinates. To jam them together in one big array, and then just say, all right, that's, in, that's a circle in camera 2 UCS. Give me it to me in sRGB. Right? And this one line of code here has 100 years of color theory baked into it. You don't have to worry about it. You just like work directly in that nice space. And what you get is a nice circular color map. So these are um, wind direction. Um, there's also, we overlaid it with some darkness for wind strength. And so you can see that, you know, nice things like there's this like shear here where the wind's going in opposite directions. Um, sort of smoother transitions as you move along over here. Right? And, Basically, my goal in doing this is not that, like, ah, oh, here is the great circular color map. Please, you should look at me like, I could do that, right? That's exactly what I hope you're thinking, <laughs> right? This is not, color maps don't have to be some weird, mysterious thing. Like, if you have the tools, you have a bit, little bit of understanding, you can just build a color map, doing whatever you want. Okay, now let's get back to our real goal here is come up with a good default color map. Now, we had our list of criteria. Um, so we can say, all right, colorful, pretty sequential, that sort of stuff we can just assign. Accurately make it perceptually uniform, that means we, sh we can draw whatever arc we like in camera to UCS space, as long as we make our points equally, we sort of move along it in equal size steps, it'll be perceptually uniform. M make it uniform in black and white. Um, it needs to, uh, we, that tells us what we should do along the brightness axis. It should be equal to size steps there as well. Um, so we can sort of work through, okay, so we know to be colorblind friendly, first of all, we want, to use, we, we want to avoid having red versus green. So our main axis of variation should be blue versus yellow. And then like I was saying, right, to be grayscale friendly, we want it to go from dark to light, 
in a nice uniform way. Um, okay, so do you go from dark blue to light yellow or from dark yellow to light blue? Well, sort of intuitively, there's an obvious answer to this question because there actually is no such thing as dark yellow or light blue in the same. There is no blue that is as, as, as bright as the bright yellow. And there is no yellow that is as dark as dark blue. It's just a funny fact about how color space is shaped. So you definitely want to go from dark blue to light yellow. It gives you a lot more room to work with. And so then there's basically only one choice left, right? We know we're going from this corner to this corner. Um, now looking down on the space from above, we could either go like this through green or like this through red. Um, and we thought, okay, well, so we could go through green, but one, there's less space to work with that way. You can see it just sort of bulges out more in the red direction. It gives you more room to work with. Um, and also, and anyway, you know, Perilla goes through green. So if we want to sort of be distinctive and show off our awesome color map, maybe we should go through red. Just, you know, kind of a branding thing. Why not? So, okay. So that's what we want to do. We know how to design a color. Now we just have to have, solve the problem. How do we actually, like, pick a particular curve and make it look nice? To do that, we wrote a little interactive tool. Again, you can just download this yourself and try it. It looks like this. Bing. So the trick here is so we know that on that vertical axis, we're going to make just evenly spaced steps. Like we, know to, we need to know where to start and where to end. But other than that, that axis is like totally determined by the grayscale friendliness thing. So we, you know, it's kind of hard to draw curves in three dimensions. We're going to collapse out that axis. So we have these two little sliders down here that let us change where do we start and where do we end in brightness, right? So we can you know, make it darker at the end, brighter at the end. Um, but um, that's all we need to do. And then this up here is like, this is, shows us a slice, a horizontal slice through the space looking down from above. And we can pick how we want to move in two dimensions by uh, control, dragging around these little uh, control points. Right? So it's nice and easy interactive. Over here you see a preview. And you also see um, the biggest problem challenge in doing this is you want to make sure you only use colors that are actually can be displayed on a monitor. It's called staying in gamut. And so what this is showing is down here, our curve is going out of the possible monitor colors. What's going on with that? So if I slide down here, we see the problem is I click down here. That, this chooses which brightness, which slice through the 3D space I want to show. And we can see, yep, that little yellow point there is the point that corresponds to that line, and it's in fact outside of the. Wait, what the heck? Yeah, no, there's. Shoot, I fixed this. I don't... This is being displayed like transposed. The the thing in the background is. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! No, do not install everything. Oh, uh, much better. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so right. So let me. So like, let's pull it. So we have a problem over here now. Yeah. Here you can see right. That's because the if we slide this, we can see as the yellow kind of moves into the space, it becomes okay. As it moves out of the space, right. So it's just a little video game, right? Keep the little yellow dot inside the colored thing. And then once you do that, you could. It takes like two minutes to design a color map. All right, Kevin, what's your favorite color? Green. green. Okay, let's start with green. Um, well, it's kind of up here because these are dark. You can, it's, oh, yeah. If I slide it up, you can see it better. We'll start with like a dark green. And Allie, what's your favorite color? Blue. Blue. Okay. <laughs> let's end up with blue. And what should we go through? Wow, this is. Anyone? Maybe it's sort of through the magenta -y kind of thing. All right. Why is this not? Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, I got it flipped around. Okay. So this, the bottom is supposed to be up in green, <laughs> and the top is supposed to be down in blue. What is going on? Sorry. Okay, our demo's not working as well as it's supposed to. This is why we need a separate person to drive. So. <laughs> so we're going yellow to green with what? Um, 
First, let me make sure I'm actually, okay, so that's the top. The top is supposed to be down here at blue, we said. Here's the bottom, but you want that to be up at sort of green. Okay, now I, at least I'm unconfused. Now let's move this into green, or sorry, into a, a green that's actually possible. And let's move this into a light blue that's actually possible. You can see it's not very good because there aren't very many light blues. <laughs> we could try cutting, make it so the brightest thing is not so bright. So we get a little more. And then we can say, well, let's make the middle sort of move out more towards sort of pinky red, as far as we can go with it. Yeah, right? And it's a color map, right? <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> it's really easy to do. This is terrible. <laughs> this is a huge problem. Because now we've, got, we've solved all these problems. We can design a new wonderful color map in two minutes. Um, well, we're, we're trying to get a group, like this anarchist collective of an open source project, to agree on one <laughs> color map. So this is sort of a classic failure mode of this kind of group. It's called bike shedding, this kind of debate. Where this is based on an old uh, story about um, you know, some old management who watched a, uh, sat in on a meeting of a, like a planning board. And the first thing on the agenda was they had to decide whether to approve the built plans for a nuclear power plant. Right? And they had this like, stack of documents like this high, and they sort of flip through and say, okay, and they debate it for 10 minutes and they pass it. No problem. The next item on the agenda is about the bike shed <laughs> to be built next to the nuclear power plant. And this turns into a two-hour debate, <laughs> right, about like, oh, what color should it be and all this. Because it's, it's I mean, nuclear power plant, that's kind of hard to have an opinion on. <laughs> the bike shed, everyone's got an opinion on that, right? This is so, that's easy. And so and everyone wants to have their opinion heard and respected and listened to and get involved. Um, and in this case, like, this is a classic bike shed thing. We are actually literally trying to decide what color to make the bike shed. <laughs> so to try and kind of like keep this from blowing up, getting totally out of hand, our strategy is, okay, we designed three color maps, one, two, three, one, two, three, A, B, C. We said, all right, everyone, here are three color maps. Tell us which ones you like. So, okay, this way, you know, people have a chance to, you know, have their say, feel like they participated, right? We can actually maybe hope to convert, but it won't turn into a giant mess of like hundreds of all that, right? Okay, so we did that, sent it out to the mailing list, um, and sort of did this kind of straw poll. And then we got some really useful data back. Um, what we learned is that democracy is useless. Um, and we also, you know, we sort of had a bit of that problem I was mentioning, right? So, because the tool is so easy, we just posted it up and someone said, oh, hey, so I just downloaded it and I tried making a green color map. How about this? Maybe we should add it to the list. And we said, oh, fine, okay. <laughs> have a green option. We tweaked it a little bit and put it up. Option D. Um, and then we learned something else really interesting. So, like, I mean, we, we thought we'd done a pretty good job of, like, thinking through all the different complexities here, really digging in and, like, making like really like getting it right, right? But nonetheless, you know, you put something out for peer review, people come up with things you didn't think of, and it turned out there was a criterion that um, we didn't take into account. A very important criterion. We started getting email like this one. Plus one for option D because it has green in it. That, that's the whole email, there's no body. <laughs> it turns out people like green things. <laughs> um, and it's not just that one person. <laughs> That oh, was, <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so we said fine. <laughs> I don't care, it's not jet. That's the important thing. <laughs> so let me introduce Spiritus. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like. Here's some examples. Um, the name is Latin word for green, um, but this is Python. In fact, it is named after a snake. Um, if you don't like snakes, you could also pretend it's named after a really pretty fish. Or if you have some application where like MATLAB compatibility is very important, it could also be named after a bird. <laughs> so um, that's Spiritus. We gave this talk at SciPy, like saying, all right, so this is what we're all going to use. And people believed us, so it was true. <laughs> so this is what MATLAB is, in fact, going to use in the, when they get around to making a release with it. Um, as compared to Perula, um, we have more variation in light versus dark, um, less variation in terms of the color. They're both reasonable, but I think Viridus is better, personally. I mean, I would, but <laughs> um, it does avoid that weird little hump down there. 
Um, and it has the one key feature, which is you can actually use it for whatever you want. And people are, actually. So immediately after we put this up, this thing, you know, this package pops up on GitHub. This is zero disk for R. Download it if you want. Someone made a whole uh, long, look at the with that scroll bar there, right? <laughs> Explaining what, you know, to our bloggers why you should use this. Giving examples and all that. And people, are, right, picking up, hey, what's the best palette for heat map for colorblind audience? Because people are complaining at the Ecological Society meeting. Oh, Viridus, that's Viridus. Neither of those are me, I promise. <laughs> people seem to be picking up on it. Um, you know, Stack Overflow. Uh, Someone asked a question about color maps in PGF plots, this LaTeX plotting library. Well, I, I love this thing so much. Let me um, do some publicity. <laughs> um, pair of you, Viridus. Um, let's add Viridus to Arrow Show or RWPY or VizPy or VCF or B even available for MATLAB. <laughs> 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 so, um, so yeah, yay! <laughs> Seems to be working, right? So yeah, we said Matplotlib 2.0, big major release, changing everything. They're keeping everything the same except changing the default style. Um, you can read about it there. Um, and they are switching to Viridus. This will be the new default. No more Jet, hooray! Um, we like it. Maybe you do too. Maybe you want to use it. Feel free. Um, if you don't like it, all of these are available. Um, they all have names now. Um, or you can make your own. Okay, hopefully, I've shown you it's not too hard. And yeah. 